All right, we're all, we are now on chapter 15, the final chapter in Foundations of Sense and Perception by Dr. George Mather, a psychology press book. And we are reaching, uh, again, individual differences in perception. Experiments on sensation and perception are mostly conducted in university R1, R2 laboratories, so participants tend to be university students who are, by and large, young, usually fit, well-educated, and highly motivated. And so many of them are actually students of psychology or neuroscience. In the United Kingdom, for example, two-thirds of university students are below the age of 24, with females in a slight majority. And despite using such a narrow sample of people, researchers assume that their conclusions generalize to the entire population. However, this is very debatable, and this assumption is open to question. Conditions uh, that we have discussed earlier can have a profound effect on perception, so experimenters routinely exclude participants who have a condition that could adversely affect their performance. And even so, individual differences in the performance of normal subjects are often found and can be significant and highly stable across different testing sessions. But they are generally treated as noise, random fluctuations in response, and removed by averaging data across groups of subjects. Several demographic factors are known to produce consistent individual differences in perception, and sometimes differences are found which cannot or are not attributed to demographic factors. We will review evidence regarding the effects of all of these factors on inter-individual differences in perception. Again, even within the same individual, perceptual functions are likely to vary as a result of such factors as diurnal rhythm, the menstrual cycle, life events, intake of psychoactive substances such as nicotine, alcohol, caffeine, cannabis, and so on. First, we will talk about age. Uh, there are changes in perceptual capacity over the lifespan. Uh, many studies have measured perceptual capacities at different stages of the lifespan. The methodological problems of studying perception in infants are particularly demanding. Experimental procedures are used in order to study adults, and they are generally not suitable for research on infants. So a range of techniques has been developed in order to specifically cater for infants. The tutorial describes some of these techniques, but when we compare data from infant studies against the data collected from adults at various ages, a general pattern seems to emerge of rapid early improvement followed by gradual decline. All, all graphs, for example, are plotted so that smaller y-axis values correspond to better task performance. Performance generally follows a U-shaped function with optimal performance during the late teens and early 20s. Uh, we find vision, for example, um, is extremely uh, wide-ranging um, from an infant all the way to uh, those that would be the, uh, in geriatric, from pediatric to geriatric. Uh, just simply from developmental changes in the eye. We can have perceptual capacity over the lifespan and poor sensory modalities. Uh, you can have uh, vision, hearing, smell, and touch uh, compared to uh, visual acuity, uh, threshold for hearing, uh, identification errors for smell, and two-point acuity for touch, and then we could have the age and years uh, and for the X value. Developmental changes in the retina, for example, or, uh, uh, and things like that to, for the biological aging of the eye, uh, mostly uh, reduced uh, vision. Uh, hearing, we have reduced vision as, or hearing as well. And of course, there's smell and taste as well as touch. Um, Uh, concerning hearing, uh, we have peripheral factors that are involved in developmental improvements and sensitivity, which are changes in the resonance of the outer ear, middle ear infusions, or buildup of fluid behind the eardrum in very young infants, and immaturity in the uh, cochlea. Peripheral factors and uh, also are decreased efficiency of sound transmission through the middle ear ossicles, decreased flexibility in the basilar membrane and deterioration in the cochlear hair cells. Then there's smell and taste, of course, as young subjects um, 
in here far better than older subjects. Uh, touch, uh, touch performance peaks in the late teens and early 20s, declines uh, monotonically thereafter. Uh, it's likely because of the reduction of the number of touch receptors with increasement of age. And then we of course have changes in the brain over the lifespan of the human. It is clear from the preceding discussions that changes in peripheral sensory structures play a significant role in age-related changes in perceptual capacity. But in many cases, peripheral change cannot entirely account for age-dependent effects. We must also consider the effects of age on the brain itself. The brain, for example, increases, the weight of the brain increases rapidly during the first few years of life, reaching a peak at the age of 20 years old. Between the ages of 20 years old and 80 years old, brain weight declines by 9%. The change in brain weight generally mirrors the change in perceptual capacity over the lifespan. And in the next reading, we will consider what changes in the brain may underlie the change in weight. Uh, we really are talking about developmental changes. We're also talking about uh, cortical development during the first years of life and how it is characterized by growth in both dendrites and axons talking about dendri dendritic growth and cortical regions rich in axions where, uh, that are called white matter, whereas regions rich in neuronal cell bodies are called gray matter. Myelin is an insul insulating fatty sheath surrounding axons that promotes rapid and efficient neural transmission. Studies of white matter, and indeed that's cortical regions rich in axon axons, axons uh, indicate that axon diameter and myelination can continue to develop throughout childhood. Uh, developmental changes in the structure of the brain must play a pertinent role in the improvements in sensory performance. Again, white matter is tissue in the brain and spinal cord containing cell axons. Gray matter is tissue in the brain and spinal cord as well contain neuronal cell bodies. And myelin is a fatty sheath that covers certain cell axons and facilitates the transmission of neural impulses. Uh, then we have biological aging concerning changes in the brain over a lifetime. And of course a huge number of experiments have been conducted to investigate differences in perceptual functions that can be linked to sex. For example, the largest sex difference in performance is usually found in variants of the mental rotation task which is the manipulation of an internal mental image of the shape so that it is visualized from a different viewing angle. Uh, then we have the origins of sex differences in perceptual function. There's been a great deal of debate concerning the origin of sex differences in performance and no doubt partly fueled by socio-political issues. Some favor an explanation in terms of differences in experience and socialization between men and women. Others, however, favor an explanation based on biological differences between male and female brains. Both, however, are factors that are likely to be pertinent, though their relative weight may vary with different aspects of performance. At least in the case of sex differences and spatial ability, evidence favors a biological explanation other mammalian species show gender differences in spatial behavior, including rats, mice, and monkeys, and testosterone levels are known to influence performance in spatial tasks. Evolutionary pressure may have led to a gender difference in spatial ability, and according to this argument, ancestral males who were best at navigation could have been or would have been the most successful hunters and therefore would have encountered more potential mates. On the other hand, female reproductive success would have been best served by reduced mobility, leading to greater energy conservation and reduced predation. We're talking about culture now. Studies of cultural differences on perception have been concentrated on two questions. The first question is, do subjects differ from cultures? Do subjects from different cultures vary in pictorial competence? Uh, pictorial competence is the ability of an observer to make meaningful and accurate interpretations of pictorial images. And the second question would be, does the ecology of the visual environment influence perception? Concerning pictorial competence, the issue focuses on the idea that subjects from cultures lacking pictorial representations find it very difficult to interpret pictures. 
uh, for example, you can give a picture, a line drawing, right? Um, of a man with a spear um, hunting a deer, for example. You could ask the question, what do you see? What is the man doing? Which is nearer, the man, the elephant, or the antelope? That could be, um, and so we have that as well. Uh, we also have um, ecology. Uh, we have a geometric, what's called a geometrical illusion, which is a figure containing simple geometrical forms that is designed so that parts of the figure appear distorted in size or angle. And of course, um, culture effects. Uh, the oblique effect is the reduced visual acuity for oblique lines and gratings relative to vertical and horizontal orientations. Uh, there are several examples of perceptual differences linked to the level of expertise of the subject or specialization in a particular area, as indicated by what is called formal training. Um, then we have musicians. Uh, a few people possess perfect pitch, which means that they can identify the absolute pitch of a sound without aids. While most people, however, do require a reference pitch and or rehearsal in order to identify absolute pitch. Uh, individuals with perfect pitch have the shortest ERP latencies of all. Uh, concerning visual artists, we have what's called shape constancy, which is the apparent shape of an object and it remains constant despite gross changes in its retinal image caused by variations in viewing position. The strength of auditory streaming as a function of the duration of the interval between an adaptation and testing, musicians showed more streaming than non-musical subjects, and the effect dissipated more slowly. Uh, the sensation of shape constancy, um, when an untrained observer is asked to select the ellipse and a figure that is the closest match to the uh, to a circle, for example, they tend to select an ellipse that is more circular than the image shape. Um, and of course, uh, we have uh, we can compare shape constancy with color constancy as described earlier. And then there are what's called idiosyncratic individual differences. Uh, idiosyncratic differences, a large number of papers have reported consistent inter-individual differences in a range of perceptual and cognitive functions, which are not attributable to clinical or demographic factors, and therefore are assumed to be idiosyncratic differences. For example, Ginsberg and colleagues found threefold variation in spatial contrast sensitivity in a large group of Air Force pilots, but this variation could reflect differences in simple visual acuity, which was not measured. Uh, we also have uh, 20 subjects that were tested between 20 and 30 years of age. All, all of them were members of Duke University in the United States, using seven visual tasks ranging from orientation discrimination to form identification. They found large intersubjects differences in performance. Uh, scores in most tasks tend to co-vary, so if an individual scored highly in one task, he or she tended to score highly in other tasks. It is possible that at least some of the variation reported reflects differences due to expertise and sex, since these factors were not controlled for in data analysis. Uh, then we also have a study of the attentional blank in which detection of visual targets in a rapidly presented sequence of stimuli is impaired if they appear up to half a second after the previous target. Participants were drawn from the University of uh, Groningen uh, with no history of neurological problems. The study found that about 8% of participants showed no attentional blink at all, uh, non-blinkers as opposed to the majority of blinkers who show the effect. And then we have a measurement of spontaneous reversal in the apparent direction of ambiguous, um, ambiguous structure from motion stimuli. Uh, in 52 healthy volunteers and found consistent individual differences in reversal rates. 
Although they are often ignored, there are significant inter-individual differences in perception which relate to a number of factors that vary between experimental participants. Uh, when we really get down to it, we talk about age, the performance generally conforms to a U-shaped function with rapid improvements in the first decade of life, followed by a gradual decline after the fifth decade of one's life, uh, which is the age of 50. Uh, these changes can be attributed to changes in the efficiency of the peripheral sense organs and the uh, and, and the efficiency of signal transmission within the cortex of the brain. Concerning sex, there are sex differences that are frequently reported in all sensory modalities, with female subjects that are generally outperforming male subjects, except in tasks that involve spatial vision. Uh, Male-female differences are usually small relative to the variability of scores within each sex. However, physical differences between male and female brains, perhaps as a result of natural selection, evolution by natural selection, could underlie some of the sex differences in performance. Uh, concerning culture, a number of studies claim to find differences in perception between subjects from non-industrialized cultures and subjects from industrialized cultures. Early studies claim that non-industrialized subjects found pictures difficult to interpret and were less prone to visual illusions involving judgments of straight lines and angles. Much of the evidence, however, is not convincing and subject to alternative interpretations. Uh, concerning expertise, formal training in music or art, for example, produces consistent differences in perception. Musicians can, take, can make finer discriminations of timbre and auditory streaming than that of non-musicians. Artists also show less shape and constancy than non-artists and do not perform better than non-artists in most of the visual tasks that have been studied. Practice at simple visual discriminations typically improves performance by more than 10%, but the effect does not transfer well between different tasks or between different retinal locations. Several neuroimaging studies have found physical differences between experts and non-experts, indicating that plasticity of the brain in the cortex may be responsible for differences in performance. And then we have what's called idiosyncrasy which is marked individual differences in performance, which have been reported for a number of sensory tasks with the corresponding variations and underlying neural structures. The origin of these differences is still unclear.